It was only after the investigation into the disappearance of Edna Suttles did they discover that this man was responsible for killing three other women. He is a serial killer. I made no mistake about it. Key West 911, what is the address of um, I, I need somebody. I, I need somebody at Conk Town right, right away. Somebody just got shot. The shooting happened in this back parking lot of the Conk Town Liquor and Lounge, a building that has a lot of surveillance cameras. How many shots did you hear? I hit it like a couple shots. A man carefully parks his SUV at a small town motel's parking lot, appearing ordinary. This middle-aged individual pays close attention to his vehicle's appearance, polishing it carefully. He walks away without obvious worries. Remarkably, this man, Daniel Prince from Bostick, North Carolina, had committed a brutal murder of an 80-year-old woman less than an hour earlier. A man walked to another lot, unnoticed as a serial killer enjoying the day in South Carolina. He planned to bury his latest victim in North Carolina, his fourth kill. His carelessness would make it his last. If you tell him to turn that off, I will talk to you a little more freely. On August 27, 2021, in Traveler's Rest, a small town on the border of North and South Carolina and hidden in the Appalachian foothills, 59-year-old Daniel Prince took advantage of the serene, out-of-the-way location in Greenville County, South Carolina as his perfect hunting ground. Prince, a handyman, was hired by Edna Suttles for home repairs, leading to a friendship and earning her trust. Edna, an 80-year-old retired businesswoman and owner of A1 Freedom Bail Bonding, was well regarded in her community for her vibrancy and her efforts to assist other elderly residents. That morning, Edna planned to visit a homebound friend whose family relied on her. She left home, but never reached her destination. Greenville County 911, what's the location of your emergency? The thing is, a fitter was supposed to show up to be with my mom today, and she's in her 80s, and she didn't show up. We've come to her house, and we can't get nobody to the door or anything. Her name is Edna Suttle. This is not like her. She shows up like clockwork. So something's wrong. In most places, adults aren't deemed missing until 24 hours of no contact. However, the Greenville County Sheriff's Office recently revised this policy. Initially, from a Sheriff's Office standpoint, our missing persons were reported by phone. We would take a report by phone. Uh, the Suttles case, we changed some things here, uh, and the Suttles case was kind of in time with that, if you will, where we were going to respond to every missing person. Um, Usually, it was, you know, there had to be some extenuating circumstances, some type of medical issue. Sheriff's deputies checked on Suttles but got no response at her door. After securing a warrant, they entered her home, finding no signs of foul play or clues to her location. Her missing champagne-colored Jeep Grand Cherokee raised the first alarms of possible foul play. Miss Suttles was a she's pretty well-known in the northern part of this county. Uh, she was a bail bonding agent. She was a tough lady street smart, uh, had, a, had a great reputation here in our area. Uh, she was certainly nobody's fault. Edna disappeared, provoking police to issue media alerts with her vehicle's description, license plate, and a note on her possible need for medical help. Unaware she had been murdered and moved across state lines, it took seven days before a local police officer found her Jeep at a Best Western Hotel in Traveler's Rest on September 3rd. The vehicle was parked to hide its license plate from passing viewers. After confirming Edna didn't check into the hotel, the Greenville County Sheriff's Office reviewed security footage. They discovered the Jeep's arrival with a man exiting, clearly not Edna. He wiped down the vehicle, focusing on the passenger door's interior, door frame, and quarter panels. After a quick final wipe, he left the area. Many missing person cases end innocently, with individuals taking brief trips or facing personal challenges like mental health crises or extended romantic encounters. However, investigators recognized that Edna Suttles' disappearance had turned serious and unsettling. It seemed unlikely she was willingly out of touch. The focus shifted to identifying the mysterious man from the security footage and uncovering events before the timestamp at 1.46 p.m. There were still hours unaccounted for since Edna left home that morning. With ever-present surveillance cameras, investigators searched for puzzle pieces, tracing back from the known date and time, scouring the small town for leads. Law enforcement diligently collected video footage from the area, establishing a timeline for the day. At 9.22 a.m., a Chevy Cruze was seen in the parking lot of a Food Lion supermarket in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Just eight minutes later, at 9.30 a.m., 
Edna Suttles left her home in her champagne-colored Jeep Grand Cherokee, as captured by a nearby antique store security camera. At 9.38 a.m., a man resembling the individual seen leaving Edna's Jeep at the Best Western bought strawberry yogurt cups at Food Lion using a store rewards card. This identified him as Daniel Prince. A minute later, Edna Suttles arrives at the grocery store and parks near Prince's vehicle. Prince, holding a grocery bag, gestures to Suttles before fetching a small bag from his own car. He then joins Suttles in the front passenger seat of her Jeep. Moments later, the Jeep departs the parking lot with both individuals inside. Four hours elapse before further video evidence emerges. At 1.43 p.m., Suttles' Jeep heads back towards her residence from the direction of the Food Lion supermarket. At 2.02 p.m., the Jeep returns to the supermarket parking lot, but in a different area. Prince exits the Jeep from the driver's side and walks to his Chevy Cruze. He maneuvers his Cruze alongside the Jeep, transferring something from one vehicle to another. A closer look reveals it's a person with Suttles' distinct blonde hair. Prince then drives Suttles' Jeep away, leaving the blonde-haired person in his car. Five minutes later, Prince parks at the Best Western, wiped down the Jeep, and heads back towards the Food Lion lot. At 2.14 p.m., Prince returns to his Chevy Cruze with the unmoving Suttles and drives off. The video trail ends there, but Prince's purchase led investigators to his doorstep. The rewards card revealed an address in Bostick, North Carolina, about 70 miles away in rural Rutherford County. The man behind this, Daniel Glenn Prince, became a key focus. Investigators pondered the connection between Prince and Edna and how they met on that crucial day. Originally from Michigan, Prince relocated to the North Carolina mountains a few years back, settling into one of the many secluded haulers in Rutherford County. Despite its friendly atmosphere, privacy was abundant, perfect for someone seeking it. Prince, alongside his wife KK, found their niche there. He worked as a handyman, often assisting elderly, single, or widowed women. With his skill and charm, he quickly built relationships and earned their trust. However, Prince kept his troubled past hidden. As a young man, Prince enlisted in the military to escape a troubled life. However, his military career was brief, and he couldn't avoid a criminal path. Records revealed charges including assault, battery, and firearms violations. Most alarming was a 1997 Michigan conviction for kidnapping, resulting in a 13- to 30-year prison sentence. He served 12 years before parole. His supervision ended two years after parole, and he left the state, eventually settling in North Carolina. With a name and a history of kidnapping in hand, the Greenville County Sheriff's Department swiftly reached out to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department across the state line. Probable cause for auto theft was established, prompting a quick warrant to arrest Prince and search his property. The Rutherford County Sheriff readily aided in executing the warrant. Prince surrendered calmly to the numerous heavily armed officers who descended upon his property. Totally cooperating, just relax. Not doing anything, not cooperating. Oh my God. Stand up on your feet. Stay right there. Yeah. Sir, I would be very cooperative. All right, let's try that Chris. Prince was promptly arrested and transported to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department for initial questioning. From the outset, it was clear that Prince sought to dominate the interview and steer the conversation. His arrogance and apparent lack of concern were evident, so investigators allowed him to speak, observe his behavior, and gather information. I talked to you about August 27th, 2021, this year. What day of the week was that? Oh, it was a Friday. Okay. Which, which, where are you on that day? What's your typical Fridays like? Some Fridays I go do jobs, some Fridays I stay home, some Fridays I go look at jobs, I do all okay. sorts of things. Days run together for me because I don't have a set schedule. Fair enough. Whereas the jobs come, right? Mm hmm. Okay, so specifically the 27th. Mm hmm. What, two weeks ago? Do you remember where you were at? Not specifically. Where do you think you were at? I've been going all over the place. I've been back and forth to okay. Charlotte. I've been down to South Carolina. Yeah. Like, where's your jobs in South Carolina taking you? Um, actually, I was down to Traveler's Rest, but I don't know if it was Friday or Thursday. I know I'd been there earlier that week. Okay. But you don't remember which day specifically? No, it was either Thursday or Friday. What kind of job were you working on? I wasn't. You wasn't? I wasn't. This lady had talked to me several times. I'd been down to her house two or three times. We kind of got to be friends. This woman has so many damn problems, mostly her daughter. Yeah. And what she did is she had me looking at 
um, duct work mm -hmm. that she wanted done because somebody had done duct work for her and she was suing them oh, because wow. they didn't do all the duct work or yeah. something. She would call me and have me come down there. Okay. And she was constantly having problems. She said she needed to have money at one point in time to help her daughter because her daughter was in jail. Then she needed money another time because, um, what was it the next time? She was hiring a private investigator because her son-in-law was, she talked to me all kinds of stuff about it. We got to be pretty good friends about stuff like okay. that. But she kept seeing like she was blowing me off and I actually doing any work for her. She wanted me, she was gonna have a guy come up and wash her house and I said, well, if I'm coming down here to look at other stuff, I got a power washer, I can wash your house and clean out your eaves for a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. She was gonna have me do it. Packed my power washer up, went down there. Never did the work. Because she's, I don't have the money right now. I gotta sell a bunch of jewelry. I gotta sell a bunch of stuff to go ahead and get more money for a private investigator. Then she wanted a different private investigator because she didn't like the one she had. So it was like one excuse after the other. How'd you meet her initially? Years ago. Okay. Years ago, when it was somebody had given me her name or number or her my name and number. I get passed around a lot. Okay. So it was a years ago thing. That's pretty awesome. Your name made all the way down to your Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. That's good reputation. Yeah. You know, solid work. All right. So, so why what, are we? What you're telling us is that's not you on the 27th. Food line parking lot, Traveler's Rest. I don't think so. That's not you. That's me. Where's that? Food line, August 27th, 2021, 923. Okay. 32 seconds. Bring a bell? Yep. Yeah, I went down to food line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so what were you doing down there that day? Um, she wanted me to look at some stuff in her house. Okay. And she picked me up at Food Lion because she wanted me with her when she was um, going to go meet some guy for uh, for um, God damn private investigator okay yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that she wanted me to meet her down there okay she was nervous because she says I'm not sure I trust this guy and she knows I've been in the military and she says will you meet me and I go yeah. And I said, where do you want to meet? She says, well, he's been talking to me. I guess I'm supposed to meet him at a restaurant. And um, I'm supposed to meet him down near Food Lion. Okay. So I went down to Food Lion and she met me. And mm. he didn't show up where we went to next. And she had been trying to get a hold of him. And we went to her house for about two hours. And then we went back to Food Lion and it just she, she just dropped you off and you went home and you just know something about PI well she wanted me to see if this guy was going to meet her okay. where he was supposed to meet her do you know where there was a hotel lobby that he had finally said meet me at the hotel okay she says drive up there and see if he's there and I drove up there and things are starting to sound really squirrely to me. And then she finally said, just drop me off at home. And if you drop me off at home, my daughter will pick me up. And I said, because I got to get going. I can't be yeah. doing this all day. So that's y'all uh, coming down 25, you and her together. Back, back towards the hotel. It could be. Okay. Because that's their car. That's about thirteen forty five on the twenty seventh. Okay. So that's so you're with her there? Yeah. Okay. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying yeah, I'm, I'm just saying yeah. that, that could be her. Yeah, it's a different angle, but I mean, you know, we've watched this car. Right? Okay. Here's y'all in the uh hotel parking lot. Okay. Yeah. Oh look. There's y'all y'all backing in. Yep. Yeah, a couple of different copies of it backing in, backing in. Yeah. Oh, look. You get out. Nobody else gets out. I told you that. You're walking around the car. Yeah. You wipe the entire car down. Because I was worried. You were worried. 
There's you walking across the parking lot in front of Little Caesars. Mm -hmm. And there's you getting back into your car and driving away. Oh, she's with me. Look, man. Where's that? What do you, I don't don't have to do. We need to know. And I, listen, Dan, mm -hmm. okay? You are a good dude. I honestly do believe that, that you screwed up years and years ago. Okay. And now... Can I look at these? What? I just want to look and see what you're talking about. Let's... let's no, yeah, Mr. Sir, Sir, you need to hear this, man. Okay? Mm -hmm. You're not a bad guy. That's right. Nobody is saying that you're some evil, twisted dude. Mm -hmm. Okay? Where's the right now? Her family is desperately looking for her. She's missing right now. Yes, Dan, where is it? I don't have a clue. Yes, I dropped her off at Ed, her house. Dan, Dan, please listen. You did not drop her off at her house. We have followed that car the entire day up and down 25. Mm -hmm. There's a number of minutes that are unaccounted for that are not by her house. Okay? Which car? Mine or hers? Dan, stop playing games. You know what we're When talking. I got, okay, I can help you here. Okay. You gotta give me a second. You gotta let me answer the questions when they're asked. When I dropped her vehicle off looking for the guy, she said she wanted me to take her and drive around in my vehicle. So I left her vehicle. I went down to Food Lion and she was in my vehicle with me. And I dropped her off at home. Damn, we watched the video. She is not. The car sits there. It sits there, man. No, no, not in her car. Never. My car. We watched I dropped you go her back off of my line. car. You did not drop anyone off, man. I picked her back up. She yeah. sat in my car at Food Lion, and I went back and got her. No, you did not. When are you trying to say? Please explain. Explain yourself. Please explain at which point that we must have missed in the video that you dropped her off. Why your, that your vehicle never went back to her house. We have your vehicle, that silver car, going straight up 25 and not stopping at her house. That's not true. It is true. I Dan. stopped at her house. What's your wife going to think about this? Well, my wife would be very upset if I had done something, but I didn't, and I don't know where Edna is. I think you do, Dan. No. I don't know where Edna is. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Damn. Let's go back to why you wiped the car down. What, what you said you were worried about what? The only thing I did was because I knew I'd been in and out of her car all the time mm -hmm. with her. I'm like, there is no way in hell I'm going to just leave this thing here. Mm -hmm. Because she's got somebody that's after her. It's not making sense. Of, it's, I mean, you're the last person to be in a vehicle you wiped down of a, of a lady that's missing. That sounds really fucked up. It does. Mm -hmm. it does. That's why we're here. But and then it's, it's fucked up as it sounds. We're having to do it right. We're going to do it right. until. But we got guys down there now that are homing in about where we think she might be. As Prince's narrative unfolded, it became apparent that his story was incoherent and inconsistent. However, the inconsistencies were not yet sufficient for immediate action. Meanwhile, deputies continued searching his property. They uncovered a significant arsenal, including two AR-15 variants and around 20 handguns, along with a substantial amount of ammunition. Notably, the serial numbers on the AR-15S had been removed, a federal offense under Chapter 44 of Title 18 of the United States Federal Code, which prohibits convicted felons from owning firearms. This discovery escalated the investigation to the federal level, allowing Prince to be detained for a more extended period as the investigation progressed. As the search persisted at Prince's residence, more incriminating evidence emerged, although unrelated to Edna Suttles' disappearance. Instead, this evidence unveiled a hidden truth. Prince was a serial killer, unnoticed by his community for years, even by his wife. Among his possessions, deputies found the driver's license and passport of Nancy Rigo, a 66-year-old woman from nearby Charlotte, North Carolina. Rigo, a widow, had been missing since 2017, maintaining only a regular digital communication with her family. Whenever asked to meet in person, Rigo, or the individual posing as her online, refused. Family members confirmed Rigo and Prince were believed to be in a relationship during this period. Her wallet and financial records listing Prince's address as hers were discovered among his belongings. Additionally, Prince possessed Rigo's bank card, 
These findings raised law enforcement's suspicions that Rigo may be deceased, with Prince potentially exploiting her finances. Another search warrant was issued to gather more information about Rigo, while the search for Suttles continued. Among the items seized were Rigo's belongings, including her mother, Dolores Sellers Gore's purse, who had passed away in 2017, prescription bottles under Rigo's name for cyclobenzaprine, tramadol, and lorazepam, all filled in 2017, were discovered. More disturbingly, a black bag contained zip ties, a taser device, lubricant, and crushed pills labeled Ativan, a potent sedative that, when mixed with alcohol or certain substances, can slow breathing or cause death. In custody, Prince continued to claim innocence regarding Suttles' disappearance, buying himself time. However, on October 9th, his time ran out. Prince's wife decided to leave him and began preparing to sell their home and surrounding property. Enlisting friends to help clean up the property and tend to some chickens and other birds, one of them stumbled upon a large white bee box deep in the woods at the property's corner. Unaware of its existence, Prince's wife immediately notified law enforcement, prompting them to search the box. With a new search warrant, deputies from the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department discovered more incriminating evidence inside the bee box. Among the findings were Suttles' purse, Jeep keys, rope, zip ties, and various other personal items belonging to her. Notably, a single opened cup of yogurt was also found, matching the type and flavor purchased by Prince on the day of Suttles' disappearance. Nearby lay a vehicle's back floorboard panel, a black plastic bag, and a tarp. The floor panel matched one missing from Prince's other vehicle, which had been taken in for repairs immediately after Suttles' disappearance. The repair shop confirmed that one of the requested repairs was replacing the cargo compartment panel, matching the one found in the woods. The items discovered in the trash bag at the scene were personal belongings, potentially belonging to Suttles, such as jewelry, a bracelet, and a pair of shoes. These items were sent to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division's Forensic Services Laboratory for testing. Additionally, the yogurt container showed signs of drug contamination, including traces of cyclobenzaprine, tramadol, and lorazepam, matching the same pill bottles belonging to Nancy Rigo found in Prince's home. Recognizing the significance of the discovery, law enforcement brought in a cadaver dog to search the property on October 10th. Although the dog didn't find Suttle's body, it alerted officers to the scent of human remains in the area where the panel, trash bag, and tarp were found. While Suttle's body hadn't been located, officers were now certain they had evidence of her murder. While in jail, Prince remained steadfast in his story through two interviews. He admitted to knowing Suttle's and having visited her in Traveler's Rest multiple times before. Initially, he claimed that on the day of her disappearance, he met her and drove back to her home to discuss a private investigator hired for her daughter's divorce. He then returned alone to the Best Western parking lot in her Jeep to retrieve his own vehicle and leave. Prince explained that he wiped down the car to avoid involvement in the private investigator's inquiries. Prince maintained his story, believing no evidence existed to challenge it. However, with new evidence in hand, law enforcement initiated a third custodial interview. It became apparent that Prince knew he was cornered, encouraging him to quickly take control of the narrative and the approaching outcome as much as possible. There are things that have to happen, and there are things that are going to happen. And I'm a realist, and I have acceptance with this. I would like a little bit of control in how they happen. If you tell them to turn that off, I will talk to you a little more freely. For nearly an hour, Prince confessed to law enforcement, acknowledging the need to disclose his crimes fully. Realizing the severity of his situation, he quickly negotiated a deal to avoid the death penalty, knowing life imprisonment was the best outcome. As part of the agreement, he offered to reveal information not previously known to law enforcement under the condition that his attorney be present. Most crucially, he revealed the location of Suttle's body to the officers. In May of 2022, Prince guided law enforcement officers to a nearby property where they discovered Suttle's buried body, still identifiable. During the custodial interview, he continued to admit his involvement in the deaths of Dolores Sellers, Nancy Rigo, and Lee Goodman. 
Prince confessed to multiple murders, revealing himself as a serial killer. In regards to the deaths of Dolores Sellers and Nancy Rigo, Prince claimed that he hypothetically assisted in euthanizing the elderly Sellers, suggesting Rigo was involved as well. He hinted that Rigo later regretted their actions and threatened to go to the police leading to her becoming his next victim. Prince disposed of Rigo's body, kept it a secret, and used the power of attorney she had given him to redirect her social security checks to his address. Seller's death, initially considered natural, was reinvestigated and reclassified as a homicide. The third victim, Lee Goodman, originally from Florida, vanished between the deaths of Rigo and Suttles. Prince alleged that Goodman attempted to rob him, resulting in a fatal altercation. He disposed of her body in a rural area after cleaning up the incident. However, no evidence of a robbery was ever uncovered. Prince opted to avoid trial and accepted a life imprisonment sentence. We certainly want to thank y'all for joining us today as we announce an arrest and subsequent plea deal has been reached in connection with the disappearance and death of Edna Suttle. She went missing from Greenville County on August the 27th of 2021. This investigation uncovered the man responsible, a man who has now been identified as a serial killer residing in Boston, North Carolina, 59-year-old Daniel Glenn Prince. Daniel Prince is currently serving his sentence with no possibility of parole at the United States Penitentiary Hazleton in Bruce Mills, West Virginia, a maximum security prison. It's ominously referred to by inmates as Misery Mountain, fitting for Prince's crimes. While Prince will spend his remaining days there, his actions have devastated families and communities. As Prince spends his days in Misery Mountain, another case unfolds in Key West, Florida. As the night winds down at Kongtown Liquor and Lounge in Key West, Florida, three young men leave the busy bar and head out into the dimly lit parking lot behind the establishment. As the night crept into the early hours of Monday, the calmness of the parking lot was shattered by the sound of gunshots. A single shot rang out, followed quickly by two more. In the aftermath, one young man's life would come to an abrupt end, while another's would be permanently changed. The question loomed, what had happened in those fateful moments, and why? It's essential to emphasize that this case remains unresolved in a court of law, and all defendants are presumed innocent until proven guilty. The critical questions linger. Was this tragedy a deliberate act of murder or an act of self-defense? Could alcohol-induced negligence have led to a devastating accident? Yes, hello, I just shot okay. someone. In you just shot line. someone? Who did you shoot? I don't know, what is your name? Jared Hughes. Jared Hughes. Okay. Why'd you shoot him? I uh, came to be aggressively in my parking lot at Concown. Okay, we have units in route. You said he approached you aggressively? Yes. Are you the owner of Concown? Yes. Please send uh, ambulance. Yes, there's units in route. Is he awake? Yes. Are you, are you awake? Okay, do me a favor. I need you to put the weapon away. Can you do that for me? Yes, the weapon is set aside. Okay, there's a unit pulling up right now. Okay, can you tell me where you hurt him? Where are you injured? Where? Uh, in the stomach. Hi, I'm there. I'm here. Sir, are you with the officer? Yeah. Situated along North Roosevelt Boulevard in Key West, Kong Town is a popular hangout spot known for its vibrant party atmosphere. Separated from the waterfront by a road and a picturesque row of palm trees, an international house of pancakes flanks it on one side and a Wendy's on the other. Its inviting ambiance makes it the perfect spot to enjoy a few drinks, catch a game, and grab some late-night food with friends. The attached liquor store even offers a convenient drive through window. While it caters to locals, Kong Town also draws many visitors to the island. On this specific evening, 21-year-old Garrett Hughes, along with his brother Carson and friend Logan Manuel Pellissier, were drinking at Kong Town and having a good time. Known affectionately as Cheeto by some friends, Hughes was a famous young man who had previously shined as a star athlete in football and track at Key West High. Good. Good. Hughes, now in his early 20s, Hughes had begun training as a firefighter and dedicated his time to volunteering as a coach at both his old high school and nearby Horace O'Brien High School. 
an enthusiastic fisherman and diver, he led a busy outdoor lifestyle in his hometown of Key West, where he had resided since his parents relocated there when he was just one year old. Known as a well-respected and active community member, Hughes was generally regarded as a good-natured individual in the area. However, on this particular night, he was intoxicated and enjoying himself at Kongtown. Also present in the bar that evening was Lloyd Preston Brewer III, a 57-year-old businessman deeply rooted in the community. Brewer had come to Kongtown to watch the championship game with his niece and her boyfriend. After they left, Brewer remained, perhaps hoping to strike up a conversation with someone at the bar. Throughout the evening, Brewer admitted to consuming three beers. Notably, Brewer was also the owner of the shopping center strip housing Kongtown and a few other neighboring stores. This area was not just his business, but also his literal part of town, suggesting he had a vested interest in the activities unfolding in the vicinity. Just after midnight, I began to notice something, Brewer recounted to Key West Police Department Detective Marcus Del Valle during their interrogation following Brewer's arrest later that morning. Um, I noticed there was a lot of activity going to and from the back door, okay. as we have discussed in the past, yes. correct? Yes. So I went out back to just see what was going on. As you know, I am armed. Nature of my business, my property. All right. I went out back and there was not one, it, this was not a drug dealer, I don't think, just a guy. And he had buddies with him and there were, there were cars, but he was in between two cars there were, car, and there, there were people on either side, and I guess they were all together. I okay. don't know. They hadn't come from inside the bar. I don't know where they came from. And he's pissing in the parking lot okay. and on the building. And I said, man, can't you just go in the, in, I'll be honest, can't you just go in the fucking bar and piss in the toilet? And we exchanged words. And as it progressed, he became more agitated and approached me. And I said, look, I own this. Stop. He continued to approach me. I said, I'm armed. It appeared as though he was reaching for something. The first shot went off this way. The second shot went off up in the air. To the best of my recollection, he was already on top of me. It would happen that fast. Okay. Prior to this night, there appears to be no prior knowledge or connection between Brewer and Hughes. Hughes had only reached the legal drinking age in November of 2022, just a few months prior. Immediately after the shooting, Brewer promptly calls 911 and places his firearm, a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, on the hood of a nearby car. While Hughes's friends check on him, Brewer awaits the arrival of the police and rescue workers. Upon their arrival, the police secured the scene, and ambulance teams and EMTs immediately began attending to Hughes. Despite their efforts, Hughes gave in to his gunshot wound at the hospital just 25 minutes after the incident occurred. Brewer was detained at the scene for a period before being taken to the Key West Police Department for booking. It was almost sunrise when he was interrogated about the events that emerged. Brewer seemed to have at least a professional passing acquaintance with Detective Del Valle, likely from incidents occurring in and around his property over the years. At the time, Brewer waived his right to have a lawyer present. Detective Del Valle even lent Brewer his reading glasses to help him read the provided documents. Brewer began to assert his case for standing his ground. That fast. My property, I've stood my ground, I feared for my life. Okay. Brewer proceeded to recount the exchange that occurred between himself and Hughes before the shooting took place. We were going back, like, who are you? We were just going back and forth on this thing, and it just got me that fast. Okay. It, 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 was, it was not a long, drawn out process. It really wasn't. Because if it had been, then his buddies that were here would have, I mean, okay. had they all come in together? and it been a fist fight, things might have ended differently. But that dude was agitated already. I mean, you can test me for drugs or whatever, I don't know. I, I, I swear I hope he's okay. Unaware of Hughes's death and the seriousness of the situation, Brewer continues his description of the event, 
emphasizing his perspective that it was a defensive action. I hit him in the abdomen. I don't think I hit him with the second shot because the second shot went in the air. It was that fast. Was there any contact with you on him? Did you grab him? Did he grab you? Did Was there any uh, hand contact? Not to my recollection. Okay. It, 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 it happened so fast, but when somebody's coming at you that fast, I got you. It doesn't, got you. It doesn't matter. All right. Now, if we're going to get into very minute particulars, that's what I'm going to ask for a lawyer. Okay. Because I'm, I'm telling you the overall scope of what happened. And the reason I asked for you is you understand the dynamics of that establishment. Yes, I do. And you, so you know I'm armed all the time. Nature of my business and what goes on back there. And really, all I was doing was walking through here to see what was going on to give you okay. a call if something was happening. All right. In the following minutes, Detective Del Valle repeatedly prompts Brewer to recount the events, diving into the details of the confrontation. Eventually, their dialogue circles back to the critical moment when Brewer made the fateful decision to discharge his firearm. At what point did you draw on him? Was it here? When he got... When I fired, he was about this close. Because I fired on him. It appeared as though he was reaching for something, and he's coming at me. And by okay. the time he got that close, I fired, and he's on top of me. Okay. Did he fall on you? He came, yeah. Oh, did he like, like did he, my second shot went in the air. Okay, so were you, he was you, fell, on, you fell on the ground? Do you, you remember if you fell on the ground and fell back? Yeah, I, I, he came at me. Yeah, because when I broke, yeah, I, I, I got up, but he wasn't on top of me okay. by the time it all ended. He was on the ground. Okay. After multiple opportunities to state and restate his version of events, Brewer lays out his perspective on the incident. Subsequently, he asserts control over the situation and suggests how it should be approached. Right. And I'm going to maintain stand your ground all day long. I mean, it's my parking lot. He's coming at me. I, I mean, I, it, what I hope comes out of this, I understand your job. And I understand friends don't cross that line for your job. I think this is a case for a grand jury. Well, that's that's what we're here. Do you know my job? Yep. Um, I think this is a case for a grand jury to investigate all the facts. This is something that we we get all the facts. We get all the we get everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We put everything together. And you know, and I'm not going before anywhere. we I do anything, I don't want to go to jail tonight. But you know, I'm not going anywhere. So, you take it to a grand yeah. jury. That, well, that's up to the state. Following his attempt to manage the situation, Brewer requests special handling from the local police. So here's what I would ask: if if you want to hold me for whatever reason, give me three or four days. Here's why. I'm a one-man shop. I've got to pay estimated taxes. I'm the only one that can do it. Okay. I've got to be in my office. I don't care if you come and sit with me to make sure I don't go anywhere. Right. But I, I've got to be able to do that. It's only after half an hour of interrogation and the prolonged wait beforehand that Brewer begins to ponder the fate of Hughes, the young man he had shot in the parking lot. Can I ask you how the fellow's doing? Right now, he's uh, critical. The detective offers no response and exits the room to attend to paperwork and verify Brewer's request for medications. After a prolonged wait, Detective Del Valle returns for one final round of questioning, allowing Brewer to repeat his account of the final moments of the conflict. Brewer steadfastly sticks to his story. Before we go, um, just one question I want to ask because once we get everything and go to the state, when the guy came, you said the guy came towards you, do you remember anything or any type of 
threatening things that he told you or anything that he made actions? I know you said he grabbed yeah, something. He, he was coming to aggressively get me. He was getting taller than I was. All right. Did he show anything? Like, did you remember anything? Hand maneuvers, hand things. Do you no. remember anything? It, it was just that fast. No. Okay. Right. Following their discussion, the detective informs Brewer that it's time for them to proceed with necessary steps and transport him to the local hospital for his prescription medication and a blood alcohol test. As preparations are made for the transfer, Detective Del Valle reveals to Brewer the unfortunate outcome for Hughes. All right, Preston. Um, just so you know, I'm always up front with you. What do you do? The hospital had contacted us a little bit ago. I just talked to the detective that was out there, and the, uh, the kid did pass away. So I just want to let you know that, all right? Um, unfortunate thing, but I, I got to tell you, I've known you too long, and there's no need to, to hold anything back. But um, we're going to do the blood draw. They'll give you your medication out there, and then um, we'll, right, and we, while you're doing that, we're going to do what we got to do and then see what, those, what avenue the state wants to take, okay? All right, they'll, uh, they'll take you now, the gentleman that went downstairs will take you out there. Police detectives and those present at the scene allowed Brewer to articulate his perspective. However, Hughes never had the chance to share his side of the story. Instead, the responsibility fell heavily on the CCTV footage, captured by cameras owned and installed by Brewer's family to safeguard their property. The security footage shows Hughes walking or staggering across the parking lot, shirtless and seemingly consuming from a bottle or can. Subsequently, he proceeds to walk between two cars on the opposite side of the parking lot and begins urinating on the wall of a separate building named the Peacock Plaza, which is owned by a different family and is physically and legally distinct from the one housing Kong Town liquor. In the security footage, Brewer emerges from off screen at the left side of the screen, coming from Kong Town's back door. Pausing briefly, he appears to assess the situation before turning back towards Hughes's companions, engaging in conversation with them, and then redirecting his attention back towards Hughes. From approximately 40 feet away, Brewer is seen drawing a weapon. Meanwhile, Hughes still has his back turned to Brewer. As Brewer advances across the parking lot toward Hughes, the handgun is already drawn and pointed toward the young man. Hughes eventually turns and takes a few steps forward, verbally exchanging with Brewer. One of Hughes's companions moves closer to the center of the lot, seemingly attempting to gain Brewer's attention. Hughes takes another lurching step forward, prompting Brewer to step back. However, Brewer, not Hughes, then advances aggressively with his gun drawn and fires at Hughes at nearly point-blank range. The altercation ends in both individuals falling to the ground, with Brewer seemingly ending up on top. Police forensics analysis conducted at the scene later revealed that Brewer had fired a total of three shots, contradicting his recollection of firing only two. The case now hinges on the differences between Brewer's narrative of the incident and the video footage captured at the scene, which does not precisely verify his version of events. What is evident is that a shirtless, intoxicated, and unarmed young man lost his life in the parking lot that night. While the video footage does not appear to show Hughes acting aggressively, it lacks audio, preventing us from determining the conversation between him and Brewer. Additional witnesses at the scene will need to provide their accounts to shed light on the interactions when the case proceeds to court. A potential argument could be constructed for Brewer's actions under Florida's Stand Your Ground law had he remained in the center of the lot where he momentarily paused, with his gun drawn and engaged in conversation. During this time, he could be perceived as controlling the situation. However, when Brewer advances another 15 to 20 feet as Hughes zips up and turns around, any movement forward, even a drunken stagger from Hughes, could be misunderstood as a threatening action, regardless of its actual intent. Even Brewer, upon reflection, acknowledged that he could determine Hughes was unarmed at that moment. Hughes reaching for his waistband could plausibly be interpreted as the young man simply adjusting his pants after urinating. It's possible that the movement of Hughes's companion into the open area of the parking lot triggered Brewer's fight-or-flight response, perceiving him as an additional threat. Whatever the cause, the irreversible outcome unfolded in seconds, forever changing the lives of those present. 
Brewer is presently detained without bond, having pleaded not guilty to second-degree murder in Hughes's death, as well as aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for threatening Carson Hughes. Additionally, Brewer faces a federal misdemeanor charge of carrying a firearm in an establishment primarily for alcohol consumption. If found guilty of second-degree murder, Brewer could face a sentence ranging from 25 years to life, subject to mandatory minimum sentencing due to the firearm's involvement in the fatality. The passing of Garrett Hughes deeply saddened the local community, as he was cherished as a beloved and active member. A benefit concert was organized at Key West Coffee Butler Amphitheater to honor his memory, drawing over 2,000 attendees. The event featured performances by local celebrities, raising over $50,000 for a scholarship fund established in Hughes' name. Remember, it's your curiosity that fuels this channel. Keep exploring, stay inspired, and join us for more amazing content next time.